Hi everyone, welcome to Data-Driven Analysis, Applications of Clustering. We are very excited to dive into the world of spatial machine learning and statistical clustering with you today. I am Ankita Bakshi and I'm a product engineer on the Spatial Statistics team. Before we get started, why don't we have Flora and Lauren introduce themselves? Hello, I'm Flora Vale. I am a product engineer on the analysis team. I focus on data viz and spatial analysis throughout the platform. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Lauren Bennett. I am the lead product engineer on the spatial analysis and data science software development team here at Esri. All right, well, we have a lot to cover in a pretty short amount of time. So why don't we kick it off? So the truth is that this topic of clustering is huge. And really, there's a lot of different things that clustering means to different people. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite areas of spatial analysis because I think it's such a natural extension of the way that our brains work. We're inherently, naturally always looking for patterns, looking for clusters in data. I know um, whenever we look at a map, even someone who isn't uh, a spatial data scientist, who isn't into spatial analysis, it's human nature to look at a map and look for clusters. And so um, really what these clustering tools do within ArcGIS is extend what our brains and our minds do naturally whenever we look at a map. But within that, there really are uh, several different approaches to that quantification, to that clustering. Um, there's statistical clustering, and there is this machine learning approach to clustering. And of course, today we're going to be focused on that machine learning approach. Um, but I think it's worth uh, touching a little bit on that statistical approach because it could very well be um, the set of tools that you'll come across that will be really important. And we have workshops that focus on that we'll, that we'll point you to at the end. Um, but I think understanding both of these areas help equip you um, with the necessary information to figure out what's the best tool to solve your problem. Because just because a method uses machine learning doesn't mean it's the best method to solve your problem. Um, so it's really kind of taking a step back and thinking about, well, what what question am I really asking and figuring out which tool best answers that question. So in terms of statistical clustering, you can think about it like uh, what we have at, its, at the heart is a null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is oftentimes this concept of complete spatial randomness. So we're asking this question, how likely is it that this pattern that I'm seeing, where in this case we've got all the high values falling together, how likely is it that this pattern happened randomly? So I'm seeing it visually, but I want to understand if it's just random luck that if I picked all these values up and threw them down, I might have all the high values cluster together. Or is there something else going on here? Is there some, some underlying spatial process that's led to this clustering? And when we are confident that that clustering is not just random, um, it can help us decide that actually this is a place where we want to implement some policies or allocate resources. So we're asking this question, how likely is it that this pattern's random? And we answer that question using statistics with p-values and z-scores. And those maps that we create show us where we have clustering that's different of, of high values and low values that's different than we would expect based on random. So that's really what that statistical clustering is all about. And my guess is that you've encountered um, quite a few problems where that's a good way to kind of answer the questions that you're asking. Now, clustering with machine learning is, is quite different. Um, the way that I think about it is it's, it's like we're trying to find these natural groups in our data. Um, and those groups can be based on a number of different things. The groups might be based purely on location where, you know, we look at a bunch of points on a map and we see that there are these clumps of points together. And then there's some that are off in space as kind of outliers or noise. And we're looking for methods that without me having to tell it what a cluster is, it just finds them in the data. Now that's um, that's what makes these clustering tools unsupervised machine learning because we don't say this is what a cluster looks like. The, the algorithm in a data-driven way figures out what a cluster looks like based on the overall patterns within that data. 
So sometimes it's based purely on location. Sometimes it's actually based purely on value. There's no geography at all. And we're just looking for clusters in data space where we're looking for a group of features that all have a high value in terms of income and a high value in terms of education levels and a high value um, in terms of spending on ice cream or whatever the case may be. But we're looking for features that have similar characteristics based on the attributes that we're giving to the algorithm. And so it's finding those groupings. So that's really what the that value-based clustering is all about. But even though it's not spatial, we often get a lot of value out of mapping the results of that analysis because it helps us see what the spatial patterns are in those natural groupings. And then, of course, there's this intersection where we use location and value together. And there's a number of different methods that allow us to do that, and even some that let us bring time into the equation. So lots of different ways that we can think about um, clustering using machine learning um, to find these natural groupings in our data. And we're going to talk through quite a few of them. Um, the, the way that this uh, workshop is kind of set up is we're going to dig deep into how these algorithms really work so that you can understand them, feel confident using them, and feel confident interpreting the results so that you can use those results to, to drive decision making and to make an impact. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Flora, who's going to start by talking about the first set of tools that we'll be looking at, which are uh, is a tool to do density-based clustering. So that's that location-based clustering. Thanks, Lauren. All right, let's start with density-based clustering. So density-based clustering, like Lauren said, finds clusters based purely on location. So let's say that we have this set of points and we want to see if there's any clustering, if the points kind of tend to clump together. And the result might look something like this. So features that belong to clusters will be marked with the same cluster color. And then features that did not belong to a cluster will be marked as just random noise. So there are three different methods that we can use for density-based clustering. We have DB scan which is defined distance. We have HDB scan, which is self-adjusting, and we have optics, which is multi-scale. So let's take a look at how those work. DB scan defined distance. So for each of the three methods, the first thing that we're gonna need to do is determine what the minimum number of features required to be a cluster. So in this example, I am going to define five we need at least five features for a cluster. And that will determine the core distance. The core distance is how far we need to travel to reach the minimum number of features required, in this case being five. So um, we have our core distance. And with dbscan, we also define our search distance. So how far are you uh, going to search to, to look for features to belong to your cluster? And if your core distance is less than your search distance, then those features get marked as a cluster. But if your core distance is larger than your search distance, then those features will not be clustered together. Those will just be marked as noise. And so dbscan is going to find clusters of very similar densities because that core distance is fixed and the search distance is fixed. So it's going to be pretty uniform. HDBScan, on the other hand, while it still does have that set um, core distance, the search distance is allowed to adjust depending on the data. It's really a data-driven method and it's self-adjusting. So you're going to find clusters of, of varying densities. And the only parameter that you can set is the minimum features required to be a cluster. Everything else will be data-driven. And the last method is optics, which is the multi-scale method. So with optics, it's a little bit different. We're going to measure the distance from every feature to its next closest feature. And then we're going to plot those differences, those, excuse me, those distances along a reachability plot. 
And so we can see here that points that had a short distance between them, they get a small value in that reachability plot, the distance. Um, and then when features were very far apart from each other, they get a long reachability distance. And so that's kind of how we're going to be thinking about clustering with optics. The valleys will become the clusters because those features are really close together. And the peaks are where the clusters split apart or where we find noise because those distances are too great. Um, optics also has some other parameters. It has something called cluster sensitivity, which allows you to kind of fine tune your results a little bit. So in this example, if I were to increase the cluster sensitivity, it might find valleys within that cluster and split those up. So that might break that last one into two separate clusters. So a little recap of the three methods. DBSCAN uses a fixed distance, a, a fixed search distance. It finds clusters of similar densities, and it's the fastest of the three methods. HDBSCAN uses a range of search distances to find clusters of varying densities. It's data-driven, and it requires the least user input. And then optics. It uses neighbor distances to create a reachability plot. It has the most flexibility for fine-tuning but it can be the most computationally intensive. So I am going to hand it over to Lauren to show us how density-based clustering works in action. Over to you, Lauren. What we're looking at here is Waze data for the month of July in Singapore. Now, Waze data is kind of community-provided data about traffic. Each of these points represents a report of traffic. And looking at these 10,000 or so points, it's pretty difficult to understand patterns. Certainly we can see some of the major roads popping out, um, but for the most part, it just looks like a giant clump of points and it's pretty hard to make sense of. And so we're gonna use density-based clustering to make sense of it. We just point to those, that weighs data, those points, and then we have to choose a clustering method. And we talked a little bit about each of these clustering methods and I'm gonna choose optics because it gives me the most flexibility um, in kind of figuring out what clusters make the most sense to me in my understanding of the problem. So then I'm gonna choose a minimum of 50 features per, per cluster, which feels like an appropriate um, value given that I have 10,000 features. And then I, I like to start often with a cluster sensitivity of 50. It gives me this starting point in the middle and I can use that and kind of adjust once I start to explore the results of my analysis. So the analysis is going through, looking at the points, finding its nearest point, seeing what that distance is, and then going to the next point and seeing what that distance is. And we can see the results of this analysis here. And we can see some of the clusters that it finds. So we can see there's clusters along some of these major roads here. And I think it makes a lot of sense that some of the clusters are happening at these intersections. And then if we kind of zoom in a little bit, we can see um, that we also start to see I think some neighborhoods popping out. And so each of these kind of neighborhoods and the unique patterns of traffic within those neighborhoods and just the natural clustering that exists in the street network itself starts to really pop out. So um, I think the result actually looks pretty good, but we can explore the reachability chart to get a sense of it um, a little bit better in how this works. And so we can see in this reachability chart, we see the valleys, which are the clusters, and we see the peaks, which are the outliers or the, the jumps between clusters. And we can see that most of the valleys that I would expect to be picked up here are picked up. So I feel pretty good about 50. There might be a couple places where I would have expected um, some more of those valleys to be differentiated. And so we could try again with a higher sensitivity. Um, but for the most part, we can use this reachability plot to evaluate how we've done, to understand how the method works, and then to see if we want to um, adjust any further. But in this case, we really start to get a sense in this data-driven approach um, 
of what the patterns of traffic are and also just the underlying patterns of, of people in the community. Um, so I always love an analysis like this because really the data speaks for itself and it tells a really clear story. All right, next up is multivariate clustering. So now we're going to be partitioning our data into clusters based on their attribute values. So imagine that we have a set of features and they each have numeric attributes associated with them. I wanna split my features or group them in such a way that they are as similar as they can be within each cluster and as different as they can be between the clusters. So let's say we're, we have um, three variables, population density, average income, and median age, for example. And um, we're using the k-means method for multivariate clustering, which is a very common uh, clustering method. And we're going to split our features based on their attribute values. So, now we're not considering location at all, just attribute values. But you can kind of think of um, considering their location in data space, not in geographical space. But if we were to draw um, a three-dimensional scatter plot, we can kind of begin to imagine um, that third dimension uh, and, and data in that space. So within the data space, there will be clumping of, of the values of those, of those data points. And so if I were to ask um, for this data to be split into two clusters, then that might look something like this. Three clusters, it might split this way. Four, if I ask for five clusters, it might even separate that little outlier at the bottom. So with multivariate clustering, every single feature will be put into a cluster. It's not like density-based clustering where some of the features might just get marked as noise. Everything will be partitioned into a cluster based on its attribute values and how similar um, they are to the other features in that cluster. And so the result of the um, multivariate clustering will give you your features represented by their cluster color, but then it's also going to give you a box plot to help you understand what those colors mean. So it's really important that we have that visualization, otherwise we wouldn't be able to interpret the clustering and the significance of the what distinguishes those groups. And so in this example, you can see that um, the red group has the highest population density. So each one of those box plots is representing the distribution of that value for all of the, the whole data set. So that box plot for population density, that's showing the distribution of all for every feature. And then where that red point falls on that box plot shows the mean of the red cluster. So the red cluster, the mean population density is much higher than the other clusters. And, um, or you could see like for the orange outlier there it has the highest average income. So this of course is a fictitious example, but it's um, made to illustrate how we can connect the idea of, of value distributions and data space um, and clustering. So that's multivariate clustering with no spatial constraints. But sometimes we need our clusters to be spatially contiguous. And in that case, we could use spatially constrained multivariate clustering. So this method is going to partition our data into clusters based on their attribute values and their proximity. So we're still gonna be looking at those attribute values and trying to find clusters that are as similar within the groups as possible and as different between the groups as possible. But this time the clusters must be spatially contiguous. So the way that that works is by using something called the minimum spanning tree and you can kind of think of it as each of these data points has a location 
in both data space and geographical space, and there are links in between these. Some of them are closer to others based on um, their attribute values and their location. And so we go through and based on the different requirements, the number of clusters that you asked for or any attribute constraints that you may have set on your clusters, it's gonna go and break the links until it reaches the um, desired number of clusters or the attribute target. And so that was a, a quick overview of multivariate clustering, both with and without spatial constraints. And um, I'll pass it over to Ankita, so over to you. In this demo, we will see how to create attribute or value-based clusters. Researchers are working relentlessly to develop a vaccine for COVID-19. And meanwhile, the rest of the world is doing their best to prepare for and contain the spread of the virus. To assist in these efforts, we will use multivariate clustering to find clusters of locations for targeted intervention policies by using a set of risk factors. On this map, I have counties in the state of Georgia, symbolized by COVID-19 transmission risk. Transmission risk is higher for densely populated areas that have a lot of spatial interaction. We also have other risk factors like susceptibility risk. So the areas that have higher susceptible population like older adults or people suffering from chronic illness have a higher risk of COVID-19. We also have insufficient resource risk and exposure risk. So the closer you are to a large number of known cases, the higher is your exposure risk. So basically we have four risk factors for transmission, susceptibility, insufficient resources, and exposure. One way to look at this data would be to aggregate all these risk factors and create a single map to find areas of highest and lowest COVID-19 risk. But by doing that, we lose the idea that there are different types of risks and each would require probably different intervention policies. This is where a tool like multivariate cluster would come in. So I used Georgia risk map as input to this tool and added the four risk factors as analysis fields. I'll run the tool and you'll notice that I did not provide any number of clusters. You can choose to provide n number of clusters and the tool will create that many clusters for you. But if you do not provide any clusters, the tool will find optimal number of clusters based on pseudo F statistics. So if you want to know more about pseudo F statistics, you can read in the documentation. Believe it or not, we do spend a lot of time in writing the documentation so that our users do not feel like these statistical tools are like black box. And you can access the documentation by clicking on this uh, little question mark icon on each tool. So coming back to the results of multivariate clustering, you can see the tool gave me three clusters. But the clusters themselves do not really tell me anything about the characteristics of these clusters. So by default, we added box plots to better understand each of these clusters. By looking at the chart, I can instantly see that the red cluster has the highest risk for each of the risk factors. The interesting ones are the blue and green clusters that are kind of mirror images of each other. For the green cluster, the risk of insufficient resources is way less than the risk of transmission. For these locations, the priority should be to minimize interactions by encouraging work from home, by keeping children home from school, and by canceling events. Also, limiting visits to senior communities can help lower the susceptible population risk. On the other hand, for the cluster in blue, with lower transmission and susceptibility risks and higher resource risk, 
these locations will benefit from putting plans in place for quarantine centers and healthcare training. Although k-means algorithm is not spatial, but by applying this aspatial method to spatial data, we start seeing these patterns. Even if these red clusters are not contiguous, but they somehow share the same risk profile. Okay, thanks. Next is build balance zones. So this one is going to partition data into uniform zones based on feature attributes and proximity. So whereas with multivariate clustering, we wanted these groups that were very distinct from each other, with build balance zones, it's almost like the, the opposite. We want uniform groups. We want them to be e as even as possible instead of as distinct as possible. It's really a kind of like a spatial optimization. So to build our zones, we set zone building criteria. These are the requirements. So they, they can be an attribute target. So you could say each zone must have at least uh, 500 people. Or you could say number of zones and attribute targets. So I need 10 zones and each zone must have at least 10 stores. Or you could just say number of zones, split my data into 15 even zones. And then we also have zone selection criteria. So the build balance zones tool works using a genetic algorithm, which is really neat, um, but there's there's this kind of um, competition, it's survival of the fittest. And so many different solutions, possible zone configurations will be uh, compared against each other to find the best one. And that will definitely be based on your zone building criteria. Nothing that didn't meet the zone building criteria would be um, up for uh, selection. But once you have your, your zones built, the selection criteria can help you really kind of pick the, the best one based on um, some other things that might be important, such as zones that have equal area. Um, you might want them to be about the same area geographically. Compactness, so maybe you want them, because contiguous could mean a nice compact area, but contiguous could also be like a very long skinny line. So um, that wouldn't be very compact though. So sometimes we do care about compactness. Um, equal number of features. So if you didn't set number of features as part of your zone building criteria, then you could add that here. And then attribute to consider. So some other attribute to, to um, have be distributed evenly among your zones. So let's start building our zones. Um, the genetic algorithm is going to start with some random seeds and we're going to ask for four zones and so it's going to pick four random initialization seeds and then the seed will start to aggregate the features around it until it meets the zone building criteria. Rather that be I have to aggregate um, features around me until I reach my attribute target of 500 people or until I reach my you know, target number of features. I, I aggregate around until I, I reach 50 or however many features I decided I needed in each zone. And then the next random seed will do the same and the next and the next. And so this is now one possible solution to our zone optimization problem. So this solution will get a fitness score of 9.14. And with fitness scores, the lower the better. So this solution is what we call an individual, and it's going to compete in um, our evolutionary process here. So we're going to do this many times. By default, there will be 100 individuals and 50 generations. So each individual will get a fitness score, and um, eventually the the solution that is most optimal will be selected. So let's say that this is our first generation. Each one of these individuals, each one of these um, set of seeds is an individual and we have our population. So the, for the top 50% of, pop of the population from the first generation is going to move on as themselves 
and they will also reproduce, if you will, will scramble those up and they will make up the second 50%. So from the first generation, the 50% the with the best fitness scores moved on and then they also reproduced. And then from that, now the top 50% of these will move on. And so that's going to happen generation to generation by default, 50 generations until you have a convergence where you can keep going with more generations, but your fitness score has plateaued and does not get any lower. And so at, at that point, the, the optimum solution would be chosen. And one thing that I'll just go back up in here and mention, so while we have the 50% moving on and, um, and reproducing and, and competing again, we also introduce mutations just like in real genetics. And so um, we have some aliens that might come in. So just some random seeds or a mutation where um, the order of the seeds will be mixed up within the individual. So introducing some mutations and some extra randomness in to see if that diversifies the population in a way that helps to find the optim most optimal solution. Okay, so we're up to the last tool we're going to talk about in this workshop, and that is co-location analysis. So co-location analysis measures local patterns of spatial association between two categories. So this one is a little bit different. This is not a machine learning um, algorithm per se, and it's not clustering per se, but we thought that it would be useful here um, because it's still in that same vein of understanding these spatial associations. You can kind of think of it as clustering in a way. We're, we're asking if, if um, cat features of different category types cluster together or if they kind of repel. Um, so it, it is a relationship measurement as well. So let's say that I have a set of features, um, in this case, flowers, and I, I know where they are. And I want to know if they are co-located with bees. And so I also have a layer of insects. And in that layer of insects, I have a field that, that tells me what type of insect. And so I am going to ask if flowers are co-located significantly with, with bees. And to do that, we'll look at each flower's local neighborhood and see if the proportion of bees in this neighborhood is higher than the proportion of bees in the overall study area. And in this example, for this flower, it is. We have more bees in this neighborhood than we would expect um, in, in just the, the entire study area. And then, for example, this one, this flower has fewer bees than what we would expect based on the study area proportion we are gonna end up with four, well, five different possible categories or results here. So the flowers that were co-located with bees with a significant p-value, those will be marked that darker brown color. And the ones that were co-located but did not have a significant p-value, those will be marked in that lighter tan. And then we also have isolated. So um, isolated it is the opposite of co-located. So it's instead of the flower attracting bees, you can think of it as the flower repelling bees. Um, and so we have isolated significant and not significant because we're going within each of these neighborhoods, there is a, a p-value calculated to see how, how different is this proportion of bees from the actual study area's proportion and is it really significant or not? And so we get our, our results and we get a better understanding of, of things that are attracted and things that repel. Of course, also important to note here that just because bees may be co-located with flowers, it doesn't mean that flowers are co-located with bees. And that's a little bit uh, tricky to wrap your mind around, but, but if you think it through, that is, that is the case. And here I chose to look for co-location between flowers and bees. I could have chosen flowers and insects in general, or I could have chosen flowers and beetles, or I could have seen if 
if beetles and bees were co-located and not considered the flowers at all. So there are many different ways of, of configuring this and, and thinking about this as well. So with that, I'll hand it over to Ankita and she will show us how this works. Here I have two data sets. One represents the food inspection results from the city of Chicago for past two years. And the other has 311 call requests for rodent and sanitation complaints. There are so many restaurants in Chicago that keeping up with inspections is a huge undertaking. So by leveraging the existing data, we want to analyze if the locations that failed their food inspections have any spatial patterns of co-location with rodent and sanitation complaints. So we'll use the new co-location analysis tool to find that spatial association. For my input type, I'll use two data sets because my 311 request and food inspection results reside in two feature classes. Input feature of interest is food inspections layer. My field of interest is results, which contains the category of interest, which is the restaurants that failed their food inspections. The neighboring features of interest are 311 calls. Since this 311 call data set represents a single category, I do not need to specify any additional fields for this input. My neighborhood type is distance band of, I'd say half a mile, because it's unclear if the locations of 311 calls are the locations of the callers themselves, or if that's the location of a brick a rat was standing on. So I'll run the tool, and while the tool is running, it's important to understand that co-location analysis is not bi-directional. So if a failed food inspection is significantly co-located with rodent complaints, rodents need not to be significantly co-located with failed food inspections. So the, the directionality matters. The output gave me these brown and green locations. So the dark brown locations indicate the places where failed food inspections are statistically significantly co-located with rodent complaints while the darker green locations show an isolation between the two. And interestingly, these dark locations correspond to the touristy downtown areas. We might need to do further analysis to see why we are seeing such spatial patterns. Well, another thing to consider while exploring these spatial relationships is time. Let's say a call for a rodent complaint was made five months after a location failed its food inspection. That call is very much less likely to be related to the rest restaurant's um, status of inspection as compared to a call that was made two days before the inspection. So therefore we need to incorporate time to get those spatio-temporal patterns. I'll read on the analysis, but this time, I'll incorporate time in the tool. We also added this important concept of directional time. Think about it as temporal topology. So I can specify that if I want to incorporate events that have occurred before, after, or within the span of the time of my input features of interest. So in this case, I'll say I'm interested in 311 call requests that were made within 10 days before the inspection failed their, before the restaurants failed their food inspections. And I'll rerun the analysis. When incorporating time, we can see that the results are more refined and sets out to answer the question more precisely that we are asking. And in this case, we see less co-location when time is incorporated, which intuitively makes sense. So you can use co-location analysis for different type of categorical data to find um, association between two different types of crimes, or if a fracking site is co-located with the recent increase in the earthquakes, 
or um, you can also find different types of protests. Are they co-located? Because honestly, this type of categorical data exists and in many ways is untapped because of the lack of these functionalities to analyze categorical data. So co-location analysis is um, an answer to those questions. Uh, there are a ton of resources that you can use to dig deeper and learn more about the methods that we've talked about today um, and also the statistical clustering methods that we talked about earlier like hotspot analysis and cluster and outlier analysis the space-time pattern mining tools um, if you go to esriurl.com slash spatial stats, you'll find quite a few of those resources, um, as well as links to tutorials and learn lessons where you can get your hands dirty and, and really use the tools with, with real data to, to get a sense of how they really work. Um, I'd also definitely recommend, if you haven't checked it out already, our spatial data science MOOC that we put on. Uh, we had a lot of fun creating it, a lot of useful content there. Um, it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty incredible way to learn this material because you do it kind of as part of a bigger community. There's a forum where you can post questions and either together as the group or uh, we get involved in answering those questions as well. Um, so lots of content there, including some stuff on clustering, but also just broad, more broadly about spatial data science where you can get your hands dirty again with uh, real examples that you can walk through if you're like me and the best way to learn is by doing, then I definitely recommend that MOOC and quite a few of the resources on that spatial, data, spatial stats resources page. And we will start questions shortly. Thank you.